Devon Williams arrives at Christ Medical Center in suburban Chicago on a Friday night with a gunshot wound through the chest. Let me get another IV site. The first gunshot hit me in my back, and I felt it come out my shoulders. So I grabbed my shoulder and I take off running. Memorial Tree Plus. More than his shoulder is hurt. Uh, you got an 18 gauge. What's your name? Tell me your name, sir. The bullet going through his chest has caused internal bleeding that's affecting his lungs. I was losing a lot of blood. It wasn't so much of the pain. I wasn't really worrying about the pain because I really ain't feel nothing. It, it was hard for me to breathe, though. The trauma team does an emergency procedure to drain the blood, and minutes later, they rush into the operating room to explore any further damage. I'm just standing out and I get shot. I don't know. Chicago just real messed up nowadays, you know. After two days in intensive care, Devon is moved to a normal hospital room. And later that morning, he gets a visit from Charles and George. Charles Mack. Caseworkers with Cure Violence, formerly known as Ceasefire. When I visit a trauma patient, I get a gist on what their life is before getting traumatized. Um, prior to the incident, were you working, going to school? I'm self-employed, I cut hair. At the moment. As the city looks for solutions to quell gun crime, Cure Violence has teamed up with three local hospitals to stop shooting incidents from spiraling into retaliatory gunfire. What's more important? If we don't get to talk to them right away, we talk to the family. But the most important person is the patient. This situation that you got caught up in, uh, did you know the people? That shot me? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't even know who shot me. Okay. I didn't even get to see their face. Cure violence fights the spread of gun crime much like they would an epidemic of a contagious disease. Workers took immediate action on this case to stop retaliation. They came to the hospital the night of the shooting when Devon and another young man were brought to the trauma unit. We need to um, ensure that there's not a retaliation because um, other people appear. But whenever someone is shot, stabbed, or jumped on, we get a hotline call, and then once we get the call, we call and we text the hospital responder. Our workers then can interact with the friends who are hanging around in the hospital and, and say, you know, what are you guys thinking? What are you planning? And we can then cool them down there and cool them down in the neighborhood. Yeah, you think about going to retaliate? That's the biggest thing is trying to stop it. Right here, that's all. You hear to tell a story, you get to go home and see your family do what happened there. Because if you go back, think about retaliating, the chances of you getting caught. You know, I, I, I ain't too like much worrying about going retaliating or nothing like that. I ain't worrying about that. I mean. Everything in God's hands, you know, God, God spared my life, so I'm cool. Workers like Charles and George will make hundreds of these visits in a given year. LeVon Stone is their supervisor. We use incredible messengers. We talk to people that's from the community, that's of the community, and we, we're, we're touching them on wherever, we, we're meeting them on the level they're at. LeVon is a, is a very credible messenger. He is himself a, a gunshot wound victim. Uh, he was shot. Uh, and uh, was left paraplegic. He knows the, the environment. He knows what these kids are all about. I think the whole component of what we do is not just me, but everybody at Ceasefire share their life experiences with, 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 with the patients or with the participants in the community as well. Everybody does. This meeting is about the innocent people that are being killed. It's about our children who are being killed, shot to death in, in, in gang crossfire. In a community center on Chicago's west side, a couple dozen young men, on parole after serving time on gun charges, have been asked to attend a meeting. We're here to talk about what happens to a guy like you guys, to a guy with your history, who gets arrested again with a gun. For an hour, They'll hear from representatives from law enforcement and the justice system. The reason why you're here tonight is about something very, very simple. It's stopping the violence and saving lives. This is a key strategy for the city to face gun violence head on. It's all about making a case against you. The meeting is partly a stern warning and partly an appeal to these men to think of their loved ones first. It's about your family and what you put them through. Because if your family has to put you in the ground, if your family has to raise your children, you got to think about it's just not about you when you're out there doing these things. This parolee forum is the work of Project Safe Neighborhoods. It's a coalition of agencies that help people ease back into life after being in prison. 
But for those who commit another gun crime, they come down very hard. You got to believe that they are prosecuting people to the full extent of the law about these guns. Project Safe Neighborhoods says parolees who attend these meetings are 30 percent less likely to commit another gun crime. This is a good meeting. I see some angry faces, but this really is a good meeting. Because statistics show that just by sitting here and listening to this message tonight, this meeting, you are all less likely to go back to prison. As the meeting continues, the parolees hear from groups with resources to help them avoid another arrest, job training, education, and other support. The people in the neighborhoods that seen us tear it down can see us fixing it back up. And it's those services that activists working in Chicago's most dangerous neighborhoods say are most needed, much more than harder prison time. Some believe the emphasis on punishment is only doing further damage. We just think we can punish our way out of this, and that's what, as a country, we're addicted to that. You know, if you didn't get jail for your, then there was no justice. And in reality, jail is not, it's not about justice, it's about punishment. We have an imbalance of what we do with public safety dollars. We need to invest most public safety dollars in community services and things that will prevent people from getting involved in the criminal justice system in the first place. Now the causes of, of, of criminal behavior, poverty, lack of education, breakup of the family unit, we know that all those social ills contribute to crime. But at the end of the day, policing can do a lot about it, but policing supported by an entire criminal justice system can make it an enormous impact on what's happening on the streets. Even as the social ills are addressed, many agree it's behavior, the quick reflex to pick up a gun to solve disputes that needs to change most. The, the challenge with violence is you could do as much prevention as you want, but can you really dive inside of a man's mind and heart and change the way he's thinking where it's acceptable for him, an acceptable solution to a problem is to pick up a weapon and take a life or just shoot at another human being in an attempt to take their life. I think that's part of our challenge. How do you fix that? Next in the series, Chicago. a call for action. Why can't we be the Chicago, city yes. where there is no west side or south side? Yeah. A community takes to the streets to take them back. We cannot allow the fact that we're facing so many obstacles to stop us and cause us not to do anything.